We're happy to have Rachel Houts back after graduating two years ago to tell us about Axions. All right. Um, hello, everybody. I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, I'm going to talk about dynamical axions and gravitational waves. Um, and I'm visiting, I, have, I should say, I'm visiting with Invisibles Plus right now. So um, the EU has helped fund my trip to the US. Uh, and this is work I did in collaboration with Gina Kroon and Veronica Sands. Sorry. All right. So um, it's well known that uh, first order phase transitions in the early universe can produce gravitational waves. And what I mean by a first order phase transition is a transition where um, if you start at a symmetry preserving potential like this at high temperatures in the red, uh, and then the temperature cools, the potential changes shape. Uh, and if at some point along this cooling, at the critical temperature, there's an energy barrier between the symmetry preserving and the symmetry breaking minima, then you have a first order phase transition. Uh, and this means that gravitational waves could be, in some cases, a complementary probe of hidden sectors. Um, and spontaneous symmetry breaking has been very well studied. This isn't representative, or this isn't a complete list of references. And now it's starting to become more popular to study confining exotic color sectors and see what their gravitational wave signal may look like. Uh, and I'm going to introduce um, future gravitational wave detectors because the signal that we get is so weak that uh, Lisa wouldn't be able to see it. So uh, we have to even appeal to the next generation. Um, so uh, there are future proposals for laser interferometers beyond LISA, um, like the Asigo and the Big Bang Observer, which are both which are various uh, um, proposals that look like LISA, except there's more of them in orbit around the sun. Uh, and then uh, also another interesting future proposal is atom interferometers. Um, and they might be sensitive to a different region of gravitational wave parameter space. Uh, but again, these are just like next, next generation gravitational wave detectors. So um, gravitational waves from confining sectors. Uh, so there are some analytical arguments that lead people to believe that a confining sector has a first order phase transition if you have greater than or equal to three flavors. Um, and if that's true, then um, gravitational waves can probe confining sectors. Uh, and the best way people are using to do this is um, they use a low energy effective theory to try and parameterize the behavior of the potential at the critical temperature. Um, and so people have been doing things where they use um, the linear sigma model and then other um, low energy effective theories that study confined, like uh, theories below the confining gauge group. Um, but this is really a difficult thing to probe, right? Because there's a lot of non-perturbative dynamics of a confinement scale. And um, in particular, uh, a lot of the times, uh, there's no real motivation for what parameters in the low, low energy effective theory that you're using, right? So you don't, there's some parameter space where the gravitational wave signal might be good, and somewhere it's bad, but you don't necessarily know that those are well-motivated choices. And so uh, what we did is uh, we used mod model building to motivate the parameters in the low energy effective theory, um, and to try to sort of capture what's going on. And whether or not you think this is like a very strong argument is uh, sort of up to you. This seems to be the state of the literature now, but it's the best we can do. So the best. do yeah. these people think in our world, QCD phase transition is first order? I thought no, sorry, these opposite. are exotic confining sectors. So like, if here's QCD, there's some other force that confines. And we're like, at this talk, I'm going to talk about like TEV sector stuff. Mm -hmm. So for, for QCD, even though it's not really NF equals 3, it's NF equals 2.5. Because the strange fourth mass is kind of heavy, so so apparently real world QCD is right on the cusp of this, but simulations tell you that it's not first order. But the yeah. simu simulations say that for three flavors, I it think is. so. Yeah. I have a slide on it later. Um, some of this has been confirmed by the lattice community, and some of it hasn't. Um, also, this I mean I think this is a large n colors limit. So if you think that three colors is large n, then you know. This argument applies if you don't, but it doesn't. And yeah, it's your QCD is less than three flavors. So QCD is not a first order phase transition. Um, but some exotic color group with more than three flavors might be a first order phase transition. And if it is, there might be a gravitational wave signal. Um, so uh, as I said before, uh, I'm trying to use model building to motivate the parameters in the energy effective theory. Um, and so the models we're going to talk about are models that address the strong CP problem. 
Uh, so it's well known that our theory of quantum thermodynamics predicts a CP violating coupling here uh, because of the complicated vacuum structure of QCD. Uh, but experimental measurement has yet to observe any CP violation in the strong sector. Uh, and that puts really, really strong bounds on this theta coupling, which some people say is a fine tuning problem, uh, and some people say it isn't. Uh, I don't know if I'm, I'm like maybe half convinced that it's fine tuning, and I'm also convinced that we need to know whether the strong sector violates CP or not. So if the strong sector doesn't violate CP, it's like as theorists, I think we should investigate the mechanism that explains that. Um, and I also think that people should keep trying to measure this coupling. Um, but right now it's an open question whether QCD violates CP. Um, one of the dynamical solutions is to enhance the theory with a fetch and symmetry. When the symmetry is spontaneously broken, there's a resulting um, pseudo-build stone boson, which is the axion. Uh, you can think of the axion as promoting the theta parameters or the dynamical field, and then the axion goes to a CP conserving them. Um, so I'm going to introduce an idea of dynamical axions. Um, so another form of petchy quinn symmetry, because petchy quinn symmetry is just a global symmetry in the Lagrangian that rotates away the theta violating parameter. Another version of a global symmetry like that is if you introduce a massless quark to the theory. Um, so if you have one massless quark in the theory, um, you can do chiral rotations on the quark field. I have it there. Well, on this quark field. And then that changes the path integral and then shifts theta. And so theta is no longer a physical parameter. Basically the same idea. Um, and then what happens when the global symmetry is spontaneously broken? Well, if you have a theory that confines, um, there's chiral symmetry breaking, which spontaneously breaks the global symmetry. Um, and you get bound states um, that are composed of the mass quark, massive quark. And one of those bound states um, is interpreted as a dynamical axion, which is the pseudo goldstone boson associated with symmetry breaking. Um, so I'm going to call an axion particle that is composed of massless quarks held together by a confining force a dynamical axion. Uh, so typical axion models live on a line in parameter space. Um, so the most popular axion models, they call this the QCD axion line, but I'm going to call it the invisible axion model, or the invisible axion line, um, where the axion mass times the uh, axion's dynamical scale is a constant. Uh, and then here's the same thing that if you look, if you sort of uh, ext uh, extend this line past maybe where those models motivate it, but just sort of as a sketch of the invisible axion line. You can see that colliders can throw very heavy axions. And then people typically call this region that's off the line as axion-like particles. Though recently, a lot of model building has shown that QCD axions could live in some of this white region. In particular, um, dynamical axion models can do this pretty well. And so uh, the way that they do this is often they introduce an exotic confining sector. Um, so I think this is good motivation for exotic confining groups. Uh, so for one thing, uh, before I said the invisible axion line follows a relationship that looks like this, where the mass of the axion times the dynamical scale of the axion um, goes like the mass of the pion times the dynamical scale of the pion. Um, but if you have a confining sector, you can get new contributions to the axion potential that go like the confining scale of the confining sector. Also, if you have an exotic um, confining sector, you could you open up the possibility of a massless quark solving a strong CP problem because the massless quark could be hidden in bound states that are very heavy because of the um, binding energy of the confining group. And this has been so pretty new, well studied. Yeah. So these new, new contributions don't go to zero when the uh, quark mass goes to zero? Uh, no, they don't. In fact, uh, yeah, there, I don't know if this, I wish I had it in the backup slide, but there's a uh, no, sorry, they do go to zero as the upper mass goes to zero. Exactly. If you have a massless quark in the theory. Okay. No, wait. Do they go to zero? No, they, they don't. But uh, I had the six. So basically, what happens is um, every time you have a confining group that talks to a pseudo Goldstone boson, you have the anomaly diagram. And the anomaly diagram contributes something that goes like lambda to the fourth to the potential, right? And then you talk about all of your pseudo, your pseudo scalars that couple to the confining sector. And in QCD, the eta prime is, you like have a mass matrix that has the axion and the eta prime and the pions. And the eta prime is the guy that goes like the confinement scale of QCD. And so there's not a, an independent contribution that can raise the mass of the axion. 
So sorry, I guess I didn't, I didn't understand what, I asked a yes or no question and I can't tell where the answer is. Sorry, and the no. answer, the answer so, is, it's, the answer is there's an equation where that's true, but I don't remember exactly off the top of my head, but I, the true answer to the question is, if the massless quark is zero, does the mass of the axion equal zero? And the answer to that question is no. See, because that, that's, that seems kind of weird because, I mean, uh, this is a side topic, so maybe we don't have time for it. Maybe you should set your good through your talk. But, but um, you know, this is a thing that I, this idea that the axion could actually be heavier mm -hmm. than the QCD scale, mm -hmm. then it seems weird because then you should be able to integrate out the axion. Yes. And yet, the axion to solve the strong CP problem has to know about the up quark mass. Because, for example, I could just put the whole phase that I'm trying to cancel into the upward mass. You see mm -hmm. what I mean? So I agree with everything you said up until that last point. Um, so theta bar, the thing is, is that the theta parameter is very insensitive to RG flow. So you can set theta equal to zero at high energies, and it stays pretty stable all the way down. Sure. So you can solve say. the strong CP problem at high energies. That's true, and then you but don't that's have anything not what the, but I, but that's um, uh, well, I, I agree that you could solve the strong CP problem at high energies, but then whatever you do at high energies has to know about the up quark mass as well, because it is a, it's also a fact that you can put the entire phase into the up quark mass. Yeah, it has to know about the and So it has to, whatever your high energy mechanism is, has to know about the up quark mass. And in the case of the axion, uh, uh, if you're, the axion shift is what's soaking up the parameter, then the axion potential, its position at its minimum, has to know about the f Um So that's one way to say it, right? Um, sure. But that is one picture, is that the axion sitting at a minimum, and, that's, and that this minimum preserves CP, and so you know that the CP violating parameters relax to zero. Um, but that's not the only way to say it, right? Um, so there's also, there's theta bar, which is the theta parameters sitting in front of GG Joule, and then the um, combination of the phases and the quark mass matrix, right? Um, but above, like, say, the QC confinement scale, or even above electric symmetry breaking, you have the column couplings that could have complex phases. And if you rotate away the complex phases, um, you, get, you get contributions in the parameter in front of GG tilde, right? Um, but if this is a free parameter, this physical parameter shouldn't have any meaning. So I think it's okay to solve it. But I, I, I see your discomfort. We've been trying to examine this and like get it into, into like stronger language than this. Um, I don't know if you're familiar, but Bali has all this stuff with um, like the three-form axion and duality and stuff. Um, and he, he makes the same argument, but the axion, he like specifically addresses heavy axion models. And says that the axion can't be higher than the QCD confinement scale because there's this dual picture um, where you have some screening field or something. And if you eliminate the screen, the, the the Higgs field that screens this long-range force, then you somehow reintroduce the long-range force, which in the back to the original undual picture is the strong CD problem. Um, but even in that, like, so we worked through that, and we found that if you do set the force equal to zero at high energies in the dual picture, it stays zero in the other picture. So it's true, it's sort of an open question right now. Like, does it make sense to raise the axion above the QCD confinement scale? But we don't see any problems, like real problems. Okay, I mean, so that's a bit clear. This is a massive quark, not an up quark, right? It's a new This is quark. an exotic quark, yeah. But this W quark, uh, in addition to QCD interaction, they should have other strong interaction, right? Is that the picture? Yes. So, which means that, okay, you introduce a quark mm -hmm. that has a QCD interaction, mm -hmm. but it's a massive, mm -hmm. but also other, let's say, QCD prime interaction. And the QCD prime confinement skill is much larger than the standard QCD skill. Yes. And this axion, axion is just the either prime or the QCD prime. Yes. Because, because, because let's say in standard model, if up quark mass is zero, either prime is axion. Yeah. That's the picture. You could say it that way, yes. Yeah. yeah. And that's exactly, that's exactly, uh, what I think that's this a simple way to say it. It's not up quark, it's a new quark with other strong traction QCD prime. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, this is not the up quark solution. This is an analogy. It's a new massless quark. Well, I think, yeah. go ahead. I remember your last talk, right? You built a yes. somewhat complicated model, right? Mm -hmm. Because initially, you tried to do this, and it didn't work, and then you had to add a... Yes. <laughs> Eventually, it seems that you use the 
idea of algorithm at all. We uh, did use their idea, yeah. Uh, those earlier ones, like TensorFlow, don't really quite work, right? Is that yeah. So ours cool? works, so we... Yeah, so, but um, uh, is there anything more than algorithm one, or yes. is uh, I mean, any advantage over there? So, um, so, uh, I'm... So basically, we're we're working. We're trying to make a simpler model, and right. what we came up with is basically our color unified dynamical right. axiom is a SU three cubed model, right? right? So you have. I thought their model is just SU three plus SU three great It is. Angle. Yeah. So. Um, so what your we model, have, I mean, our face value looks more complicated than theirs. And they have SU three cross SU three, mm -hmm. um, and the interesting thing about um, is that so what we did is we checked that the eta prime of QCD mm. gets an independent contribution from our dynamical axions, mm. which other people who are using small size instantons didn't explicitly check. Mm. Um, so so the reason ours works does, does is because, work? no, the reason ours works yeah. is because we have three SU3s, but we relate these two by symmetry. Um, so we only need two axions, but mm. we have two independent, we have mm three sources of mass. So we have um, lambda QCD, the confinement of one of these groups, I'll call it lambda diagonal, and then we have lambda small size instantons. And like a combination of these two guys breaks to the diagonal. And the thing is, is you get small size instantons from this, you get small size instantons from this, and you get small size instantons from the confining mm -hmm. of the diagonal subgroup. But the three contributions are not independent. Mm -hmm. So you don't necessarily yeah. raise the lightest eigenstate. So ours worked because we it's true the three contributions aren't independent, but because we used unification, we only needed two axions. But is there any problem with algebra and how they That's what I'm saying. Do they need to impose some symmetry? We're actually con talking to them. Huh? We're, we're, we're planning on get, opening a conversation up with them. I think the only way to get a dynamical axion is to employ a symmetry. But the small size instanton effects can give you a lot of control yeah. over the mass of the lightest yeah, yeah. So, uh, but I think you always you don't th you don't think their model works. Okay, maybe yeah. that's something I want. Maybe we can talk about it after. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay yeah, uh, but I'm not. We're not 100 percent sure because we were we were trying to copy them to get something similar mm -hmm. too, and we kept finding that we were just increasing the mass of the QCD eta prime. Mm -hmm. We weren't we weren't increasing the lightest of this yeah. Um Also, uh, so they also did one with massless quarks. Um, I'm trying to think of another reason why ours is better. I guess ours is, you could also say that even if, like, they are able to raise their axion by a few orders of magnitude, whereas we are able to really enhance our axion mass. So we get a very different phenomenology than them as well. All right. Okay. Good? Yeah. Ready to go back to gravitational waves? All right. Um, okay, so uh, the reason, like, dynamical mm -hmm. axion models are interesting to talk about for gravitational wave phenomenology is that they have some generic properties that are relevant for the gravitational wave signal. For, so first of all, if you have a dynamical axion with a confining exotic sector, um, it needs to talk to QCD, right? If it has any hope of addressing the strong CP problem. So that means from the point of view of the exotic sector, this guy has at least three flavors, because the colors of QCD is an approximate flavor symmetry from the exotic confining group's point of view. And that's the exact number of flavors you need to guarantee a first order phase transition, so that's nice. Um, also, because uh, this guy talks to QCD, the pions that are going to form at the confinement scale here, many of them are charged under QCD. And so that means that the pions are going to have a generic form of their mass terms because the pion mass is driven up via interactions with QCD to the confinement scale. Uh, so that's sort of generic properties of dynamical axiom models, and these things are very interesting. These things affect the gravitational wave. Uh, and then the question is, uh, <clears throat> the question you asked earlier is how do we know that this is a first order phase transition? So based on the analytical... So these pions are our pions. Sorry? No, these are the, sorry, these are the exotic pions okay. that form okay. when this confines. Okay. Yeah. So like an analogy is our pions have a mass building governed by their interaction with okay. photons, right? You could do the same thing except yeah, this so time. Yeah, they're yeah. the exotic so pions and their interaction. So which pions? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, sorry. I think? No. Yes. Okay, so I uh, just, just to make sure that uh, in order to solve a strong CV problem, you need a heat sector, but you are not necessary uh, the heat sector flavor larger than three, right? It's not. It's a, it can be smaller than three. You can still solve the strong CV problem. Right? You can, but uh, not using dynamical axions. 
So I'm talking about axions that are composed of massless quarks. Okay. Um, and so if you want to solve QCD with with a massless quark, it needs to be charged under QCD. Okay. So there. So then, if you want to hide the massless quark in an exotic bound state, it also needs to be charged under the exotic group. I agree, but why you need the fully wild order of three? Because from the point, so there's only one quark. That's all. You agree that we need that quark. So from the point of view of um, when this guy confines the TEV scale, QCD is very weak. So there are three colors of this that look like an approximate flavor symmetry from uh -huh. this field, from this confining group's point of view. I understand. I understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, yeah. so you always have at least, and then you could imagine adding more massless quarks, and then you'd have more than three flavors, but you always have at least three. Uh, oh, that's yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. So that's from good. the three colors of PCD. Yeah. yeah, that's a strategy. Yeah. Um, okay. So then, uh, so if you look at this plot here that I lifted directly from somebody else's paper here, it's a very nice plot. Um, here they, they highlight first the analytical argument about um, the number of flavors being greater than three. So if you just look at the analytical arguments, um, if you go to, uh, here's the number of dark colors or exotic colors, and on the y-axis is the number of, exo of exotic flavors. Um, so if you go to high flavors, you have an IR-free theory. Um, and then somewhere in here, the number of flavors and the number of colors balances, and you have a fixed point. Um, and then here and below is where you have so few flavors that you have a crossover tra phase transition and not a first order phase transition. And the analytical argument would lead you to believe that in this white region, you have a phase transition. Um, and then what they did is they looked at lattice results and confirmed this for a few data points in this area. So it's confirmed that this is second order and the crossover phase transition here. And then lattice has confirmed a first order phase transition for three colors and three flavors, four flavors and five flavors. And then I found another um, lattice result which does it for six flavors. Um, so these points in the parameter space um, seem to be, we are more willing to believe that they're first order phase transitions. And then dynamical, the dynamical axion models I'm going to talk about live in this region, which is three colors and more. And then I talk about three and four flavors, dynamical axion models. Um, so yes. All right, um, so let's talk about the very simplest, rather than talking about color unified dynamical axion. First, just the simple dynamical axion models that have been around for a long time. Um, so the simplest is with three flavors, um, and this is done by Hook. And Hook has QCD in an exotic color sector, and one massless quark that transforms under both. Um, and then he relates the two sectors by a Z2 symmetry, so that you only need one massless quark to absorb both data parameters, because they're not independent. Uh, and this Z2 symmetry uh, makes a complete copy of the standard model. Uh, and then he has to tune the Higgs potential so that the mirror world Higgs has a much higher VEV than the standard model or the physical world Higgs. Uh, and what that means is that there's a higher VEV, the masses of the mirror world quarks are very, very heavy. And so you can integrate them out at some really high scale. And so this mirror world QCD runs faster and confines at whatever scale you want, um, depending on how you set this up and then QCD confines lower. Uh, and that's how he separates the two confinement scales. And then um, at this confinement scale here are the, uh, the is where the dynamical axion lives. Uh, so, so what happens when his SU3 tilde confines? Um, so you have a chiral symmetry breaking pattern at confinement. Um, and so that means that there's a lot of bound states composed of massless quarks. And so, again, this chiral symmetry breaking is, SU, is U3 right cross U3 left because there's three flavors from the point of view of SU3 tilde. Um, and so you have a lot of bound states, but then you have to think about what are the possible light states, what are the Goldstone boson states, and what masses would we expect them to have based on symmetry arguments. Um, so uh, after the spontaneous chiral symmetry breaking, you have nine gauge Goldstone bosons. Um, and their charges under the SU3 flavor group are 8 and 1, because there's one guy charged under this and 8 charged under this. And also, these are their charges under QCD. Um, so you have an octet charge under QCD that's a pion, and then you have an exotic eta prime. Uh, so what are the explicit symmetry breaking effects? Um, so QCD explicitly breaks the SU3 vector symmetry of the exotic group. Um, so QCD is going to interact with the pions, um, and it's going to drive their mass up to the confinement scale, the same way photons um, drive change the mass of the pions in QCD. Um, and then also... QCD, QCD gauge coupling squared there. Yeah, so it goes like the gauge coupling squared times a group theory factor times... So yeah, it's maybe an order of magnitude less. Uh, and times the confinement scale. Uh, 
Yes. Uh, and then, uh, then the GG tilde explicitly breaks the U1 axial symmetry. And so just like in QCD, um, the eta prime is driven up to the mass of the, to the confined and scale value um, via the anomalous interaction um, with the confined gauge group. And so, and sorry, in this model, do both QCDs have exactly massless quarks, or what's the... The only massless the quark model? content sorry, you probably said it. is this guy. This is the massless quark in the model. And then the other quarks, because you're talking about these flavor symmetries. This, so from the point of view of this guy, there's three flavors of this. Oh, I see. That's yes, the that's the flavor symmetry. Right. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so... Yeah, and so those are the only act, the, the massless guys and that are charged under this group because the, the rest of the standard model is not charged under the confining group. Um, and so the eta prime is the visible dynamical axion. So it's exactly what you said earlier, that like in the massless up quark solution, the eta prime serves the purpose of the visible um, dynamical axion. And its, its mass is about the scale of the confining, the, confi the exotic confining group. And then because of the symmetry relating the two theta parameters, when you solve the strong seeking problem in the exotic symmetry, you've solved it. Um, and so that's Hooke's model. Uh, and then the, the relevant collider phenomenology are these octet pions. And so this kind of gives us a lower bound on this confinement scale. And so um, the LHG has been looking for spluons. And um, because of the bound on the mass of the spluons, we have a bound that the confinement scale can't be less than about 3 TeV. So for the rest of the talk, um, I'm going to assume that this confinement scale is 3 TeV. Does this look like a conventional, from the low energy point of view, for the axion physics? It looks like a conventional axion model with a FA around lambda tilde? No, it doesn't. Um, so if you look, let's look at the invisible axion model. OK, so it's got an FA. The FA is the confining scale, right? Because above that, there's a massless quark. So the FA is like a TED. And then the mass of the axion is also, I'm sorry, the mass of the axion is a TED, and the FA is a TED which is somewhere here-ish. And so, wait, maybe even. So I guess in a way, this is something. This is an EV, sorry. The axion's living here. So it's living in this like collider probable region. Yeah, so um, it's off the invisible axion line, and it's more heavy. OK. So I, I, sh I should probably think of this more as some high-scale solution where the Z2 symmetry of these two sectors uh, plus some other high energy shenanigans is, uh, is, is setting theta to zero. So the low energy theory is just QCD with theta equals zero. Exactly, yeah. That's exactly what I, and, and theta is pretty um, insensitive to the RG effects that would right. tilt it away below that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this, you can think of the hooks model. So like in particular, that. And, and so for example, there, there wouldn't be, I wouldn't expect the same kind of AGG dual type coupling. A G G dual. Yeah, no. Uh, well, you the would see that. QCD, the QCD one. You would see the eta prime G G dual coupling, right? Because right, you the right, anomalous but, coupling. Right. Yeah. But, I mean, but not that. Not this A. The A that weighs Q E or whatever. That is the eta prime. So sorry. The eta prime of the new sector. So yeah. I'm just calling. So you could see. Okay. Yeah, you could see a but, coupling that looks like this, but this G G dual is the G G dual of the, the near world. Right. Yeah. You know, just a suggestion. You may just want to put tildes on everything that refers yeah, to the Yeah, it's confusing. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so I want to. That's fine. So I was yeah. just, I, the, the, what, that eta prime I'm yes. calling A. This is, uh, yeah, tilde eta prime. Eta prime tilde, then that is the J tilde, J tilde tilde. Yes. Yeah, that's why the tilde is not great. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, actually, once I gave this talk and someone asked me, like, but QCD doesn't break SV3 vectorial. So I think you're right. People are getting confused about the mirror world and QCD. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Bars or something. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. So, um, yeah. Just to make sure. Yeah. The lambda has to be less than 2.5 degree. Greater. Greater. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. That's not. Okay. Um, lambda that's below that is ruled out. The, yeah. Okay, ruled out. <laughs> yeah. Okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, Come on. Yes. <laughs> okay, sorry, well, sorry. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. That's, uh, so it's so it's a very. Um, it's either a mistake or a very unclear way to write it, um, but yeah. All right, um, so let's talk about four flavor axion models. So this is even older than Hooke's. Um, so Choi and Kim came up with this model a long time ago. Um, and so now they don't use the symmetry to relate the two groups. So they have QCD and they have an exotic group. Um, and because there's no symmetry, um, there's two independent data parameters, so you need at least two massless quarks to absorb them. 
So um, this is the massless port that Hook had, and then they added an extra massless port here, charged only under the exotic sector. Um, and so since they're not related by symmetry, you don't really need to play any games to separate the running. They can just have different confining scales. Um, so they just assume that this exotic group confines at some high scale. Um, and the model is pretty, and has more massless forks, but it's pretty simple in terms of um, how it solves the strong CP problem. And so now, because I'm interested in the gravitational wave signals of models like this, I'm going to look at what's going on at this confining scale. Um, so now, from the point of view of the confining group, there's four flavors, right? Because there's one, two, three, four. So you have an SU4 left cross SU4 right um, flavor symmetry that's broken by the chiral condensate. Compensate, and then you have bound states um, composed of massless quarks living at the confining scale, and then you possibly have light pseudo Goldstone bosons, which are important. Um, so we're going to talk about the masses of the pseudo Goldstone boson states. Um, so now the symmetry breaking pattern is more complicated. Under um, SU4b, we have a 15 and a 1 pseudo Goldstone boson, and then if you decompose their charges under QCD, um, you have an octet, two triplets, and then this guy, which is a singlet under QCD, but it's living in this group in this. Um, set of Goldstone bosons. And then you also have um, another guy here that's more analogous to the eta prime. But I'm going to call them both eta primes. Uh, and so these are pions that are charged in a PCD. This guy I'm going to call the eta prime composed of the psi quark, and this is the eta prime compor composed of the chi quark, depending on how you write the two degrees of freedom. And so again, the guys that are charged under QCD um, are going to be have masses that are driven up to the confinement scale because QCD explicitly breaks the flavor symmetry. Uh, and then GD tilde explicitly breaks U1A. Uh, and you can write this so that both of the eta primes couple to GD tilde, but at the end of the day, if you diagonalize the mass matrix, there's only one mass eigenstate that gets the contribution. And so one of the eta primes is going to be living at the confinement scale, and the other guy is going to be light. And eventually, um, it'll be so light that it mixes with the pions, and it'll be an invisible axion that has exactly the same MAFA relationship. So Chilean can basically wrote like a UV complete, or another version of a UV complete invisible axion model. So yeah, so these are the, so in this model, you have heavy pions, one heavy eta prime, and um, an invisible axion. So uh, this guy has triplets that are charged with QCD. Um, so you have to look at the uh, bounds on colored triplets um, that are long-lived, which are R hadrons, and that gives you another, uh, now it's written the right way, <laughs> another uh, bounds on the confining scale, but we didn't notice this. There's been an update on this. Um, and now these are ruled out to higher masses, these colored triplets, which puts a bound at 7 to EV, but all the analysis we did is 3 to EV, so um, it does need to be updated. But just a quick note. So this one you're saying is a low energy, it's an invisible axion model. So yes. the FA, the, if I just call A the low energy axion, mm -hmm. no matter what it's made out of, its F would be of order this whatever few TV scale. But that would be yeah, exactly. ruled out, right? That's ruled out um, by lots of things. Yeah, yeah, sure, 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 sure. This energy. exact version is ruled out, yeah, yeah. yeah. The TV scale, um, invisible axion is ruled right. out, yeah. Um, so yeah, this would only not be ruled out if you went to really high um, confining scales. Yeah, that's true. Um, but <laughs> there are also visible axions for NF equals 4. Um, so new physics at high energies um, can uh, induce sizable corrections to the axion mass um, via small size instantons. Um, and so here's a quick sketch of an example of how that works. So here you have QCD and you have this exotic group. And if you play some game where you have some um, spontaneous breaking of a gauge group, one of these gauge groups could get really strong, but not non-perturbative, still perturbative, and then it has some diagonal breaking here. And typically, non-perturbative effects, like instantons, are exponentially suppressed. Well, they are exponentially suppressed. And typically, that means they're very small. But if this is high enough, um, they can still be calculatable, but they can be um, sizable enough to affect the axon mass. And so, um, like Agarwal and Howe have recently re revived this in a few papers. Um, and then we wrote a paper about it here. And then also um, another group uh, at Zurich and Valencia um, talked about this as well. Um, and so, uh, remember before I said we have uh, one heavy axion and one invisible axion. But it's possible that for four flavors you could have, uh, these should be switched, but you can have one axion that's living at the confinement scale and one axion that also has a very high mass due to these small size instantonic effects, if you can arrange it so that they talk to them independently. 
Um, so that's the important point. Um, and so yeah, it's possible to play a game so that a combination of uh, anomalous effects can increase the mass of the lightest eigenstate. And so uh, as I, you guys have seen this before, but I'm just going to quickly review because it's relevant for how we implemented the small size instanton effects in the gravitational wave signal. Um, so uh, in our, and we, we used our model as inspiration because it's the one I'm most familiar with. Um, we had uh, an SU6 crossing SU3 prime that breaks to an SU3 plus cross SU3 diagonal. So the low energy effective of this theory of this guy looks like the Choi and Kim model. But at high energies, these quarks, there's one that's charged under SU6 and one that's charged under SU3 prime, just the chi. And the SU3 prime is the group that's going to be responsible for the small size instanton effects. So the small size instanton effects only affect the mass of, eta, of the prime, the downstates made of prime quarks exclusively. Then when you have the confinement, um, you have non-perturbative effects of confinement that affect the mass of the chi and the psi, and then you also have the QCD confinement, with, which only docks to the psi and the eta prime of QCD. And so you can manage to get sort of independent contributions to all the mass eigenstates this way. Um, so that's the important, that's how that works. And yeah, just uh, to show you, um, here is QCD which confines, we have SU3 diagonal which confines, and then the small size instanton effects come from this SU3 prime, which gets to a gauge coupling of about 0.3 before it breaks. And so that's how we manage to do this. Um, and so if you look, Above the cut scale, um, the chi talks to the GG tilde of, G of the SU3 prime group, and the psi talks to GG tilde of the SU6. Um, and then below the breaking, um, psi talks to the GG tilde of QCD, and then both psi and chi talk to the confining diagonal group. Um, and so if you look at the mass contributions to the dyna dynamical axion, um, you have this lambda diagonal which talks to both. And if this term wasn't here, it could only give mass to one combination of these guys. But because you have this term that only talks to one, this lifts the lightest mass I can state. Um, and, this is, and this only talks to the chi quark, which is important for how we implement it on um, the small size and the effects and the low energy effective theory. All right, so let's talk about the phase transition. So can I, I, I know I keep asking this question. Yeah, go ahead. Quick question about the, so is the, would you say that the way these heavy axion models work is that you make the small size instanton contribution larger than lambda QCD? No. no. The way they work is they implement a symmetry so that you have fewer numbers of degrees of freedom than numbers of con independent contributions to the mass matrix. The small size instanton effects can, if you don't implement a symmetry, they can they can tune around like whatever the mass eigenstates are. So like. If you have something that comes from confinement and you have small size instanton effects, and they're they like if you do something like I don't know, so the, the, it's not that if you do something I like mean, a gradient like this, said, this and is how they like work. But what I'm asking is, how big are the small size instanton? They can be really sizable. They can be so that they can be bigger than lambda QCD. Yes. As a contribution to the axion. Yeah, and what it would do is it effectively raises lambda QCD. So lambda QCD is a phenomenological measure of the small size of the effects at this confinement scale, right? But if you imagine some, you say we don't do any diagonal breaking, and breaking we just have one group, and you do something that messes with the RG flow, so you get some bump here, and then it confines. You get the confinement scale, plus you get contributions here from the small size of the effects that are perturbative that you can calculate. But the effects here you can't calculate. Okay. So yeah, and they can be really large. Um, okay. Any other questions? All right. So uh, the phase transition. So uh, we modeled the phase transition using a linear sigma model, where this uh, sigma matrix is a matrix made of the light flavors, the massless quarks. Um, and then uh, the sigma matrix, you can expand it in terms of the group generators. Uh, so this is now the generators of the SUN flavor symmetry, the Victorian flavor symmetry. So you got you have the um, unbroken generators here, which are the heavy states, and then you have the Goldstone bosons associated with the broken generators, which are the light states. Uh, and then when this guy doesn't have a VEV, you're in the symmetry preserving minimum, and when it gets a VEV, you're in the symmetry breaking mi minimum, since so it's sort of our parameter of um, chiral symmetry breaking. So um, at temperatures below the critical temperature, chiral symmetry is broken, and this guy gets a VEV above the critical temperature and this uh, symmetry is not broken. And 
ended up at zero. So, and then the question is like, what parameters should we choose for this model to model our gravitational wave signal? So, you didn't write sigma as an exponential of pseudo Goldstone bosons. No, this is the sorry, did I say nonlinear sigma? This is the linear sigma model, okay. not the nonlinear sigma model. But why? Um, because we wanted this. We understood how to do the order parameter in this model with the bar phi. Because this guy isn't present in the nonlinear. Because we want to talk about the phase transition, so you better have a model that doesn't break down at the, at the web scale, right? The thing is, is that that's the question, right? Like, we are using a low energy effective theory to model the region where the low energy effective theory does break down, but this seems to be the the best anyone can do right now. So uh, take it with a grain of salt, I think. Um, but at least there's a parameter here we can think works at that scale. So. Um, so yeah, like I said, uh, this field here captures the dynamic of the phase transition because it obtains a bit and breaks chiral symmetry. Um, and then these are the heavy fields corresponding to unbroken generators. So these are just like bound states living at the confinement scale. They're not Goldstone bosons, so they should have energy around the binding energy. And then these are the pseudo Goldstone bosons. And they have masses due to explicit symmetry breaking effects via QCD talking to the exotic confining group and the UN axial symmetry. So if you take the potential as I've written it now, and you calculate the mass of the Goldstone bosons from the point of view of the low-energy effective theory, you get that all their masses are zero, right? Which makes sense, because I haven't included any explicit symmetry breaking effects, right? Um, so then, what you want to do is you want to include explicit symmetry breaking effects. Um, so the explicit symmetry breaking effects we included in this way. Um, so the first one is um, the determinant of sigma effect, and this is really common in the linear sigma model because you know, any confining group breaks you want a, so you need a group, you need a, um, a term in your Lagrangian that is not invariant under UNA, but is invariant under SUN. Um, so you get this determinant term, um, and so that includes the effects of the, the asymptotic effects associated with the UNA anomaly. And then we also know that QCD is explicitly breaking the flavor symmetry, so we also included a term like this, parameterized by C, um, that includes the QCD breaking effect. And then finally, um, in order to include the new mass terms from the small size instantons, we include a term in the energy effective theory that goes like this, with mu SSI. And so if you turn these terms on, P is a projection operator. Because remember, the small size instanton effects only talk to one flavor of the four flavors in the sigma matrix. I don't know if it's the right thing to do, but it's what we did. It seems to make sense. <laughs> so. Because we're, I mean, right, the, the small size instanton effects don't talk to three of the, so like the three by three upper corner. They're quite weird when you actually cut out both ends. The first uh, edge and the last one, don't they just, uh, Because honestly, this yeah. is the, oh yeah, interesting. They should just, you move yeah, the yeah maybe. Here, <laughs> Extra the notation, I guess, yeah. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, uh, sorry, what, what, so this is the, this is the effective theory for your high-scale QCD. Mm -hmm. And from the point of view of the high-scale QCD, I thought that your psi and chi look the same. I mean, one of them has QCD color and the other one doesn't. But from the point of view of the SUN tilde dynamics, it seems like why I don't understand why you're singling out chi, because there's, in fact, an SU4 symmetry that... That is explicitly broken. But, OK, but then it should be suppressed by some small explicit breaking parameter, for example, the QCD coupling. So um, it depends but, on what, right, what, what effects are breaking the symmetry, right? If the QCD coupling is zero, then they, then they really are. Yeah, so it. this guy should be small um, if it's dimensionless, which depends on the number of flavors, right? Um, so, but, or wait, not in this case. In this case, it depends on the number of flavors. Anyway, this guy should be small because it depends on the QCD coupling. Right. Yeah, but I, I'm, I'm focused. Yeah, and I'm asking about the term of pu chi. Do you think that mu but sigma should be small? <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, you want me I to know ask, what you're talking about. I'm using analogy to answer your question. Terms. Okay, but why? So, why? I mean, you, I can't you, answer. You I can't ask small. my question about because this term you're writing down explicitly breaks SU4, unlike all these other terms, mm -hmm. right? In the other terms, you have the 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 explicitly the. Uh, spurions that break it, for example, QA is the fact that they have different charges, right, mm -hmm. and so on. But this term here, the only thing that breaks the symmetry is QCD interactions. Or no, it's uh, small no. Sizes. there's also small, small size instantons. 
So if I turn off the QCD coupling, mm -hmm. what is the difference between chi and psi? Chi talks to small size instantons, and psi doesn't. Wait, what, what, how, what, what are small size instantons when G Q C D equals zero? They're instantons associated with an exotic gauge group. So they're the instantons right. here from this gauge group. But why those things? The so chi is only is the only one that's charged under that thing. Sorry, can you just write down what the yeah? I, so I have the charges down, here. I'm sorry, I just so chi. So there's one of oh I'm looking over there. Okay, sorry. So. Uh, So I only have two gauge groups, color and something else? Mm -hmm. So um, there's this group. I, so I think I'm thinking of, a, probably thinking of the wrong model. Sorry, there's yeah. a lot of models going back. Yeah. Yeah. The, the color is embedded in SU6. Yes. Uh, SU3 prime is another strong one group confined very okay. high scale, which yeah. so the small instance effect. And so this is the effect of Lagrangian from what this is effective Lagrangian that's arising from which dynamical some one of these groups SU3, getting strong? SU three diagonal. Yeah. So when this confines. SU three diagonal is RQCD. No. no. This is RQCD. It's SU three prime with an S. Mixed so this with is an coming SU3 from SU three diagonal. Yeah. All right. Yes. Okay. I, I, I have to think about it more. Yeah. This um, is, this is, it's, it's so a different model. Than it definitely. So to maybe answer your question, if the small size instanton effects are large, um, it can be so large that it lifts the eta prime composed of this above the confinement scale, and then it becomes an effective mass for the masses eta prime. So it, it is a bad breaking of the SU4 symmetry. So the fact that it breaks SU4 really badly is when the small size instanton effects are large is a feature we want to capture, not a bug. Um, and then when they're small, the SU4 symmetry should be restored. Because if you can imagine that if this guy gets a mass, and in this it could get a mass so high it's above the confinement scale that it's removed from the sphere and you only have a SU3 symmetry. Okay. Um, so the one with the term with the Qs. Yes. So uh, that, that looks like what Coleman, Cal, and Wes and Zumino would tell me to write down. Okay. Because they constructed their sigma have certain transformation properties because they use the nonlinear realization. Mm -hmm. This linear thing has the same transformations, or so um, this is yeah. That we what we did was just calculated. So how, in the NF equals three cases is easy, right? The sigma model is related to generators of QCD, so you know how they transform under QCD. And the NF equals four, you only need to have them talk to like the three by three matrix that's charged under QCD. But yeah, the idea is that. Um, yeah, exactly. We're trying to capture how um, these fields transform under QCD. Um, and they have charges under QCD, right? So but maybe we can talk after and I can tell you the details. Um, but there's more details in our paper. Um, all right, any other questions? But yeah, we used, I mean, I looked at how people do this for like the photon and for other versions of this uh, model, and it's been done before. Um, okay, so. If you include two of these terms without the small size instanton effects, um, this is like just naively the masses you get for the, the pseudo Boltzmann bosons, right? So if you have this C term that parameterizes um, the QCD contribution, you see that um, the masses of the pions at NF equals 3 are proportional to C. And then um, here, the masses of the pions in NF 4 are both proportional to C with different group theory factors because they transform differently under QCD. Um, and so then if you add n pi is 3 square? Yeah, that should be square. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> uh, and then, oh no, it's everywhere. All right, sorry guys. Um, okay, and then um, if you, so this also should be square. But here it doesn't matter. But, um, all right, so then if you turn on the mu sigma term, um, you would expect that you raise the mass of the eta prime, so you get a mass that's proportional to mu sigma. And then you're also the same idea. Um, so, uh, yes. And then when you, and then again, you get an invisible axion if you don't include the mu SSI term. But if you do include the small size instanton effects, um, then you get contributions from mu SSI that raises the mass of this guy. And if mu SSI is really small, this guy can be small, but it could be larger. Right, any questions?
So that's like the, so like, that's, that's how we control the masses of the pseudo-Goldstone bosons, using the parameter and the low energy effective theory. Um, and then before I go to this last slide, this whole thing is supposed to connect the low energy effective theory to what we expect the masses of the pseudo-Goldstone bosons to be from the symmetries of the high energy theory. All right, so really quickly, um, the phase transition in the early universe. Um, so as the, uh, as the universe cools, um, parts of the universe vacuum go into the, the um, chiral symmetry breaking vacuum, which is the true vacuum. These bubbles form, they start to collide, which breaks the spherical symmetry. Then they collide a lot, and the collisions get really violent, and I can't draw it anymore. Um, and this process depends on the, how the potential changes as the temperature changes. Um, but the important things for us are the gravitational wave signal. Um, so there's the power spectrum um, at the peak of the gravitational wave, which depends on the heat released as the uh, vacuum goes from this symmetry preserving to symmetry breaking minimum. Uh, and then it also depends on the speed of the phase transition. Um, and then the other thing is the gravitational wave peak, which depends on the nucleation temperature. Um, and so for NF equals 3, um, what we did here is we have on the y-axis the latent heat, and on the x-axis the speed of the phase transition. And here we just very, very smallly varied the mass of the lightest eta prime versus the mass of the bar 5. So this is sort of like the lightest eta prime versus the confinement scale just to show a trend. So maybe this isn't physical, but if you vary the mass of the eta prime here, you see a trend um, where here we have low mass eta primes, and here we have high mass eta primes, but they're all sitting around the confinement scale. Um, and this trend shows up in the gravitational wave signal. Um, so here is the power and the frequency, and here's the, the reach of these gravitational detectors that I showed you earlier. Um, and for NF equals 3, it's a very bad signal. They're, they can't probe it. So you do see this trend that as the mass of the eta prime increases, you get a better gravitational wave signal. But not observable even by the next generation experiments. So not a very good one. For NF equals 4, we have a much better story. So again, um, now we can vary the mass of the lightest eta prime eigenstate a lot, right? Because we, it could be an invisible axion, or it could be pushed even above the like, confinement scale of the, uh, above the mass of the bar 5 quark, so above the confinement scale. Um, and again, we see this trend where for light eta primes, um, the, phase, the thermal parameters are living in this region, and as the mass of the eta prime increases, you get thermal parameters living here. And the trend is reflected in the gravitational wave signal. Um, so for light invisible axion models, um, we get uh, gravitational wave signals that we can't detect. But as you raise the mass of the light eta prime, you get gravitational wave signals that you can detect here um, by future gravitational wave detectors. Um, so, it's not your model thing, but to four, right? Yes. So, what do, you, uh, F, uh, yeah. what do you do with NF equal to three? What model? Or, um, so, NF equal to three. We're just general. doing a scan just to see the same like quality so, of behavior. So, so. But this was the hook model, basically. The hook model, yeah. yeah. And I but, mean, you could maybe push. So you could change the, the the scale of the phase transition to push this around this way, but it doesn't seem like it's very good for gravitational wave signals. Um, but this but model is very. Is, is this awesome. mostly coming from just the latent heat? Um, it's both the latent heat and the speed. But um, yeah, so I think the speed is taking you this direction, but the latent heat is much mostly responsible for pushing you up. Yes. All right. So I think the. Yeah, so we can talk about it after, but I have some theories about this. Um, but in summary, because I can't believe it, I'm actually thought of end early and I'm running out of time. Um, well, we passed through the <laughs> Yeah, so um, in summary, uh, it seems we presented the prospects for gravitational wave signals of dynamical axion models with lambda 3 to ED. Um, and there's some nice features of dynamical axion model models. Specifically, the messenger quark field gives you a lot of information about the pseudo Wilson boson states. Um, you have at least three light flavors for first order phase transition, um, and you know the masses of the exotic pions about. Um, and it seems like the gravitational wave signature is really sensitive to this mu sigma and mu in the NF equals 3 model, and mu sigma and mu SSI in the NF equals 4 sigma model. Um, and I don't know if I have time to get into this, but this is interesting. I mean, we expected this, but this is a little interesting because um, both of these guys are about the effects from small size instantons, either or instantons at confinement that break U1A anomalously, or small size instantons at high energy. 
And we know that at high temperatures, small size and symptom effects are suppressed. So it might be true that um, you wouldn't expect to see gravitational wave signals from these models because the term that generates the most useful part of the potential to make the gravitational wave is also the term that's suppressed at high temperatures. But it's difficult to capture this properly. Um, we sort of stayed um, agnostic and just said that, okay, maybe there's some temperature dependence that goes like the magnetic susceptibility. I wish I had more time to talk about this, but I don't. Um, but I think this is sort of an open question, is does the mu parameter contribute significantly at the critical temperature? And if it doesn't, I don't know that you get great gravitational wave signals. Um, yeah, so, yeah. I thought you could raise the mass just from the small size instantons. Yeah, but they are also, at, high, at low temperatures, you can calculate them, but as you increase the temperature, they get exponentially suppressed again. But isn't it the temperature relative to the dynamical scale, or the scale of the instanton? High. Maybe. Um, yeah, maybe we can talk about it more after. I have to think about that. Yeah, then maybe that's the only way. Um, but definitely, then, if you're not doing the small size instantons and you're just doing the normal confinement, you run into this problem too. So I guess I'm arguing with what other people have done as well is that they depend a lot on this new parameter to get a gravitational wave signal. And it's not clear that that's well motivated. Um, but I think there's this is like an open avenue for a new study. Um, so, uh, basically, uh, hopefully I've convinced you that exotic color groups provide a window to richer phenomenology. Um, gravitational waves can probe exotic confining groups, maybe. Um, and they open up the possibility of visible axion models. Um, and uh, it does seem like gravitational wave sig signals favor models where the high energy effects of extra color groups provide additional sources to the axion mass. Thank you. Now you can ask your questions, Mark, since you saved them all. No, I have to go to my I have to go to a committee meeting now. I'm sorry, so that's why we had to move this seminar at this ungodly early hour. So I, I really do have to go. All right. But we'll we'll talk again. Okay, sounds good. Yeah. I would like to see the fragmentation on this slide. Okay. No, I don't have a specific question. I just uh, oh, just to see it. Yeah, so if you had a, the right hand plot, but there is M5, bar 5, which is like five a, one of the heavy non goldstone boson. So you can yeah. think of this as being around the confinement scale. Okay, and um, eta prime, which eta prime is this? Um, and this is prime. the lightest eta prime. So um, it depends exactly on how strong the small size instanton effects yeah. are. Um, because if they're weak, then the lightest eta prime is yeah. the one that corresponds to the small size instantons. But if yeah. they're really heavy, if they're really strong, then it's the other eta prime, the combined yeah. scale. Yeah, the lightest eta prime. But I think, actually, I think the interesting vary is the eta prime associated with the small size instantons. Because up till here, um, I think it's not until you increase it past this and the mass is, the bound state breaks apart that the other guy becomes the light state. So. Yes, here it's the eta prime associated with small size instantons. So it'd be nice to have a plot where you do the scan, but just over small size instanton contribution. So yeah. the, this eta prime is the the one with small instanton. Yeah. So I want to. And then you assume it's to be it's the lightest one. So no, we don't assume. So we know that. Um, the mass of the other one is living at around the top of the scale, okay. at 10 times the mass of this guy, mm -hmm. about, or about within an order of magnitude. Mm -hmm. If you push this guy higher, then you push it above the confinement scale and it starts to break apart. Okay. And so then you have to do a different phenomenology because you don't have an eta prime, you have a massless quark that's got a large apparent mm -hmm. mass from small size instantons. Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think the interesting range here, but the interesting range here, it is the, the But I think what's going on is that the potential really depends on this energy bump. And this energy bump is only given by this mu parameter in both models. And so it's like really sensitive to this mu parameter, which I think means it's sensitive right. to the U1A anomaly effects. And so the so gravitation. I missed the energy bump? So, um, I think what's going on, speculating wildly, is that this bump here 
is what the gravitational wave signal is really sensitive to. That is true, right? I think this bump is mostly coming from the mu parameter. Well, I thought it was sensitive to the jump from the false minimum to the true minimum. So but at, it means at some, but it doesn't jump at when they're the same. So the real energy, statement is right. It, it, there's some temperature where it's down lower and then it jumps. Yeah, but when that happens, this needs to be sizable because there needs to be energy in the bubble wall. So it's sure here the bubbles start nucleating and nothing happens. And then more bubbles nucleate because now the jump is happening, right? Um, and then what you want is that when that process is happening, there's a lot of energy in the bubble walls to release so that when they collide, you get a lot of this turbulent collision and you get a gravitational wave signal. And so I think that if this, if this is really strong when this goes lower, right, then you have a good gravitational wave signal. Because the other people that study it, they tend to like have large parameters for this mu parameter in their low energy signal model. They just choose that area of parameter space because I think it's the best. Um, and so we're, I'm kind of curious whether that's realistic. Um, so we showed what we would expect that mu parameter to be in well-motivated models and showed that it is really sensitive. But there's still this open question of whether that mu parameter is even well-motivated in our models at high temperatures, which is where the space transition is happening. So, and that, that we don't have an answer to, but we think it's something that should be looked at. And then there's always the open question of whether this model even captures the dynamics of the phase transition, which if it doesn't, it's the best we can do. Yeah, we can run a lattice simulation. Yeah, well, maybe the lattice community should start helping us then on this. So, so, no just so I, so all these maps are just taking these two parameters, the, the, the end of the and the data, the speed? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the thermal parameters, so the latent heat and the speed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here? Yeah. So yeah. alpha and the beta. Yeah. For any given model, you just catch it. Just alpha given the parameters in the low yeah. energy sigma model, right? Yeah. Um, so from the low energy effective theory, there's not a lot of models, there's yeah. just parameters, right? Uh -huh. So these two functions are known? Right? Yes, yeah, yeah. Just people calculate people the literature. Yeah, okay. yeah. And you have to do some um, simulation of the phase transitions. You have to solve some complicated thing. Do yeah. the Euclidean bounce yeah. solution and stuff. Yeah. Okay. So basically, uh, we, we should have a target in the frequency of the crash wave. Sorry, can you repeat the question? Which parameter in the, in, in the model determine the frequency of the gra gravitational wave? Um, so it depends, so on the thermal parameters, it depends on the speed and the nucleation temperature, but yeah. you can think of it as a, a big factor is the, the scale of the confinement, or the scale, the energy scale of the phase transition, right? Okay, so yeah. which means the, the energy, okay, so this is what just a very basic question. Maybe, maybe yeah. just the, the, the how the confinement scale, so the how the frequency, what was the what was the proportion? Of? So we chose we didn't vary the confinement scale. We chose a confinement scale of three TeV and did our study. Um, but yeah. it's not surprising that we're in the atomic interferometer mid range detectors because these detectors are specifically built to probe TeV scale based transitions. Okay. Well, yeah. what if we increase it? I'm not sure that was the frequency If we include if we increase the the energy of the base transition. Yeah. Yeah, I think it goes this way. Uh, because Lisa is down here to probe like electroweak phase transitions, um, and then it goes up here. Yeah. Uh, I but I, I think I think that the the, the signal goes down too. Yeah. But right now there's sort of like a LIGO Lisa blind spot in the TeV phase transition, and these future detectors are supposed to probe that blind spot. So that's where our model falls, which isn't that surprising. Um, yeah. Then you met. Okay. Then if you have gas scale for the transition, then you go to the super high frequency. So that's a good question. We, I, I'm not 100 percent sure. Um, so people give you different answers. So I need to think <laughs> about that more. Um, I mean, from I'm like more um, like from a model, but like effective field theory point of view, it seems like it should be harder to detect. But there are cosmologists who will tell you it's easier too. So uh, oh, okay. yeah, it depends on the person. I mean, I, I need to look into it. I don't have an answer. Just what I heard. Yeah. Say just the Hubble age. Yes. We know to a few percent now. <laughs> the cosmologists are addicted to <laughs> something like that. Yeah, which one do you use? <laughs> do you use the trunk or you use shoes? <laughs>
All right, let's thank Rachel again.